Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Everybody doing all right? I want to welcome you to Crosswinds International. Um, we are at this location here in Macon, Georgia. In case you were wondering where we're broadcasting from, for those of you out there in TV land, podcast, Vimeo, YouTube, wherever, the rest of you that are here, you should know where you are. Okay. Um, I'm going to kind of go back uh, quite a while back. I t uh, taught a lesson on the gospel of the kingdom. What started out to be a lesson basically is turning into a series. So I got out the gospel of the kingdom part one, and then things went south, corona hit, everybody gets quarantined and it kind of disappeared. So we've been on hold for a while. So I'm gonna pick up today doing <laughs> the Gospel of the Kingdom, Part 2. So I encourage y'all to go back in the files. You can go back through www.crosswindsinternational.org and go under the media section and find the YouTube and click on that and find the Part 1. Or you can go out just on regular YouTube under Pastor Ron's name. You can look up Dr. Ronald K. Powell and it'll pull up all the sermons that have been preached from this pulpit and find part one of this the gospel of the kingdom part one my name in case you was wondering was david sabet um but you should be able to recognize the face when you're looking for it back when i taught the first lesson we had got started talking about john everybody calls the baptist he was really a baptizer he was not a baptist denomination or methodist or he was somebody who baptized people, so they just called him John the Baptist. It was not a denomination. God's bigger denominations. So I just want y'all to know that, okay? But we had got started showing, you know, we're crossing from the Old Testament to the New. Here's John the Baptizer out here preaching a message about the soon coming king. He's preaching a message about the gospel of the kingdom. He was letting the people know changes were occurring and things were fixing to happen. And his message wasn't a simple, easy, polite, let me make friends and influence people message. His message was from heaven that said, repent for the kingdom of God <laughs> is coming. <laughs> things are fixing to change. And I likened it in lesson one to like a, a new sheriff in town. Things are fixing to change, get right or get gone. And we went in through scripture and we started breaking down what the gospel of the kingdom was in the message that John was preaching. And then Jesus himself comes on the scene and continues, he picks up where John left off and he's preaching the same message. And I kind of figured if Jesus shows up preaching a message and John was preaching the message that Christ is our example, it's probably a good bet that this is a message we ought to pay attention to and, uh, you know, probably pass along and preach ourselves. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to review a couple of verses, but I'm, I'm telling you, go back. I went into more depth in lesson one. Read lesson or watch lesson one. You can get the notes out there online. I'm going to go back to Matthew 4, 17. Matthew 4, 17. I'm going to cover a lot of scripture. If you got your Bible handy, look it up. We're going to do Bible quiz because I'm going to zoom, zoom, zoom for time. If you don't, at least get a notepad, write it down, go back and look it up later. Highlight it, underline it. God's word is important. Your eternal soul <laughs> depends on it. In Matthew 4, 17, in the King James Version, it said, you know, right here, this is where Jesus' public ministry is beginning. It said, from that time, this was after Jesus was baptized, you know, when John introduced him, and he goes out into the wilderness, and Satan tries to spank him, and Jesus basically spanks Jesus and showed us how to do it by... Jesus spanked uh, Jesus spoke, uh, spake, I can't even talk, spanked Satan using the word like we're supposed to. And it says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, 
for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Look down a couple, uh, Matthew 4, 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Jesus is going about preaching this message about the gospel of the kingdom. Turn over to Matthew 10, 7 through 8. Matthew 10, 7 through 8. Like I said, I'm going to cover a lot of scripture. What he says is a whole lot more important than what I have to say. Verse 7, it says, And as you go, here Jesus is teaching the disciples. Who's that? That's you and me. He was talking to them now. And I challenge you to find a verse from cover to cover that said he stopped. He hasn't. If you're God's, he's calling you to be a disciple and do the same. It says, and as ye go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Hmm. Does that sound like your walk? If not, why not? Turn over to Mark 1, 14 through 15. Mark 1, 14 through 15. Like I said, I went over these a little more in depth in uh, part 1. Here in verse 14 of Mark 1, it says, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of of the kingdom of God. Basically what we had here was like a changing of the guard. We started off lesson one where John shows up telling people things are fixing to change. Someone's coming and things is going to be different. Jesus shows up and starts telling them <laughs> I'm he he spoke of and things is supposed to be different. And right here in this verse, basically John gets locked up, goes off to jail. And now Jesus, we went from John to now it's all about Jesus. John isn't the center focal point anymore. It's all about Jesus. Guess what? That's where the focal point still is today. It ain't about your pastor, your mama, your daddy, your denomination. Your focal point better be Christ and Christ alone or you're missing it. Amen. And right here, Christ is saying <laughs> it's all about the gospel of the kingdom of God. And saying in verse 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Basically, he's telling the folks, God's got a plan and here he is. It's me. And y'all need to repent. You need to change from what you've been doing, turn around, go the other way. The religious systems of the day all that stuff, that isn't what mattered. Christ is what matters. And he was letting them know, you got to believe me. I am the truth. I am the way. I, I'm, I'm he. In part one, we define the, the word kingdom as the territory over which a king has absolute authority. Do you know that's his desire for you? Does God have absolute authority over your life? Do you give him your all? Or are you still holding back? Is he your king? Is he your Lord? Hmm. We said that the phrase, the kingdom of God, denoted ownership. It told you whose kingdom it was. It's God's kingdom. See, right now we're living down here, <laughs> pretty much in Satan's domain. This is the kingdoms of this world. 
Christ came on the scene and says, I'm here to tell you about the kingdom above. I'm here to tell you about things you can't see, things you haven't even heard of, you don't know, and I am here. I'm the answer. Every question, Christ is the answer. And we also said that the phrase kingdom of heaven denoted the type and location of the kingdom. It's sources from heaven. It's not this world systems, folks. We talked about how Jesus taught in parables. All throughout when he kept going by, he talked about the kingdom is at heaven. He told him it's nigh you. It's even your mouth. The kingdom is like. We listed a whole bunch of verses. I'm just going to call them out so you'll have them on tape. You can re, uh, rewind and play. Matthew chapter 13, verses 24, 31, 33, 44, 45, 47, 52, and over in uh, chapter 25, verses 1 and 14. All these are different verses talking in parables about the kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. I took the time to call that out so that you could write it down because it's that important to look back up and understand. Jesus spoke in parables. A lot of people say, why is he talking in stories? Because he said he would. Huh? Yeah. All the way from, go back to Psalm 78. Go back to Psalm 78. Here's something to know. When Jesus came on scene, folks, he came and fulfilled scripture. He basically walked out the Old Testament. Everything from the beginning of the book that talked about him, he showed up over here and he said what it said he'd say. He did what he said you know, he would be doing right here in Psalm 78 too. I'm reading this out of the ERV version just to simplify it. It says, I will speak using stories. I will tell things that have been secrets since the world was made. <laughs> I'm going to tell you things in stories. Basically, Jesus spoke in parables, uh, contrasting and comparing the differences in likenesses of natural things and spiritual things. He would talk about normal, everyday experiences that people could relate to, trying to, to get them, you know, trying to help them understand the spiritual significance of things and how it applied to their lives then and how it applies to our lives now, today. He was letting us know the differences between his kingdom and the kingdoms of this world. He warned of judgment if we remained in this kingdom or the blessings of heaven if we, enjoy, if we joined him in his kingdom. There has to be a change. His way. Or there is no way. And right when he gets to the end of his ministry here, back in Matthew 24, go to Matthew 24, 14. Matthew 24, 14. Again, this is Jesus is teaching his disciples. He's, he's preparing his people, his church, his body of believers to carry on the ministry, to carry on his message. And it says in Matthew 24, 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. But I'm a Muslim. Jesus died for you too. Amen. All the nations. I don't care where you're at. And then shall the end come. God said this is the message that's got to get out because people aren't understanding. They're walking around in this kingdom not understanding there's a whole other kingdom, a whole other way of life. Different thought patterns, thought processes. God's got more for you than you got a clue. And he loves you and he wants you to know about it. That's why he told us to preach it. And that's why we need to be preaching the message to usher in the coming of the Lord. To get his body ready. We need to speak his truths. The gospel of his kingdom, not yours. Man, 
my dad and I were watching uh, some YouTube videos. Was it, yes, it was yesterday. And we saw a message uh, from David Wilkerson. My goodness, talking about, you know, he started off over in Zephaniah, talking about the burden for the solemn assembly, about how, how important it is to be uh, sorrowful over the things that burden God's heart. And then he went over to Ezekiel, where it talks about woe to the shepherds that feed themselves. There's different messages going on that aren't God's messages. We're supposed to be feeding his flock, not lining your pockets. <laughs> so many pastors, they're not out for souls. Understand, folks, you're what matters to God. I don't care what's in your bank account. Is Jesus in your heart? That's what matters. That's the gospel. Unbelievable. We have got to figure it out. We covered in part one of this series about how the kingdom message is all about walking in fellowship with King Jesus here and now on earth as it is in heaven, repenting from the sin of this world and surrendering our will to God's will. Christ came and showed us how to do it and then said, follow me. The message simply is to be like him. He died. He paved the way to make what he has available to each one of us. Jesus put it as simple as he could when he said, I only do what I see my father do, and I only say what I hear my father say. Jesus basically lived a life of obedience to the father and were to do likewise. That's the gospel of the kingdom. Remembering that he's the king. We're supposed to be his loyal, obedient subjects. If he's your king, he's your Lord. You surrender. Have your way, God. It's all about doing his things, his way. And even in the model prayer everybody turns to is the Lord's prayer. It's really not the Lord's Prayer. It's the disciples' prayer when they're asking how to pray. He teaches them, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth. Here. Here. In earth. As it is in heaven. Here and now. God has provided him for you now not later in the sweet by and by one day i'm going to die and i guess then i'll go to heaven and figure out what's going on negative god wants you to know now that's why he gave us his word that's why he gave you preachers to proclaim the truth that's why he's told us to preach his gospel not man's gospel preach god's word let people know when Jesus started preaching, folks wasn't necessarily happy. I mean, think about it. The word repent is not a word you hear in most sermons anymore. What do you mean i got to stop living like the devil? I've been told that grace is supposed to cover everything and I can live like the devil. Find me a verse that says that. That's not what Jesus was saying when he said repent. Oh, we got to get a clue. Turn to Acts 3. 19 acts 3 19 let's get washed by the word of god okay we got to wash away the old thoughts and belief patterns that don't line up with god's word we got to renew our minds and we do that by getting the word in us in acts 3 19 it says to repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out Does it say, keep living like the devil so that God can just excuse it later because, you know, he understands? Folks better read God's word on the matter. He kind of has a different opinion about things than most folks do. 
Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Look at 1 John 2, 1. Again, I'm going to cover a lot of scripture. Write it down. Get in the book. For so long, too many people have been word weak. So I'm going to give you a week's worth of word. 1 John 2, 1. My little children, <laughs> these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. What? Does that sound like God's desire for you is to live in sin? Mm hmm? Like I said, I'm going to just throw some things out there. We'll tie them together later. I want you to look it up for yourself. John 8, 12. John 8, 12. It says, Then spake Jesus again. Now think about who's saying that. Jesus. They even said it right there. Then Jesus said, okay. So there's no doubt who's talking. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Did you hear that? He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. You dare to call yourself a Christian... Here Jesus is saying, if you are, you're not supposed to be out here walking in all that darkness. You're supposed to be different. When we take Christ on, the old man is crucified. We take on the new life in him. Old things pass away. All things become new. What I was, I am no more. I'm different. He said that they would know us by our love one for another. They'd know us because we're different. He didn't say they'll know you because you're doing all the same garbage they are. Unbelievable. They shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Darkness equals sin, folks, which equals death. Light e equals Christ, which equals a sin-free life. Christ didn't die so that you could just go around sinning. He did not give you a license for that. You better understand the heart of God. Look at Luke 9, 56. Luke 9, 56. It says, For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. God didn't come here to make you feel bad and send you to hell. He came here to save you from hell. He came here to let you know you don't have to live in sin. You don't have to walk in defeat. You don't have to be a victim. Amen. Christ came and paid a price for you to be victorious. You better understand what God's gospel is. What his message is. It's not the same old, same old status quo. How you doing? Fine. Mm. Look at Ephesians 1, verse 4. Ephesians 1, 4. Yep, we're going to shake off some dust. It says, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Do you hear that? God was thinking of you before this planet was even here. He had a plan for you. Chosen us from before the foundation of the world that we should be Does it your Bible say full of sin and looking like the devil? Mine didn't either. Chose you from the before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Folks, when you love someone, you want to please them. You want to be with them. You want to spend time with them. You know how many people dare to call themselves Christians and they can't stand to go to church? I got to tell them, you don't go to church. You either are the church or you aren't. We go and assemble with the, with the family because we love them. 
if heaven's supposed to be all about eternity and you're afraid to go spend an hour or so with them here, then you don't want to go to heaven. You spend your whole time trying to avoid God. You got no time. For and you think you want to go to heaven? Ephesians 5, 1. Ephesians 5, 1 says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. So, the thing you were doing the other day, do you think God was doing that on a regular basis? If I'm supposed to follow God, that means I'm supposed to do like God does. So is God really doing all those things that you might find yourself doing or I find myself? Some adjustments might need to be made here, right? Ephesians 4, 27. Ephesians 4, 27. Just a little bit back there. <laughs> Neither give place to the devil. Oh, the devil made me do it. You don't understand, Brother Dave. I got to sin. Right here, God's telling you, don't even give them place. Folks, just because the devil shows up knocking doesn't mean you got to answer and let him in. Amen. We got to go back to where we started in lesson one of this series on the gospel of the kingdom where Jesus went into the wilderness, led by the Spirit, mind you, I'm here to tell you, God's going to let you encounter issues to build your faith, to exercise his word in you, just like Jesus did when Satan came. Think about that. Satan is tempting Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. And you think he ain't going to try to mess with you? If he'll mess with him, trust me, he's going to keep trying to mess with you. And each time, Jesus himself, who was the word, kept quoting the word for our example. You, you don't understand. That's for your example. He's God in flesh. He didn't have to. He was the word. He could say, scram. It been done. But he did all that he did for our example to show us how. And right here he says in Ephesians 4, 27, don't even give the devil a place. Don't let them in, then start worrying about what to do for them and do with them and do about them. Meet them at the door, tell them no. That's repentance. This is where it starts. Conversion occurs. Look at Romans 12, 1 and 2. Romans 12, 1 and 2. A lot of you probably have this memorized. But Scripture talks about, you know, that all Scripture is given by inspiration and it's profitable for, for doctrine, for reproof, reproof, re, re, re. You got to reread things. You got to reprove them. You got to go over it more than just once. It's got, this is a living word. You got to keep putting it in. Give us this day our daily bread. Don't tell me you read the Bible once. Is the Bible reading you? Is it a daily thing? Get in here. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I beg you, brethren. Notice that word, brethren? Who is that? That's supposed to be Christians. He's talking to the church. Just like I am right now, supposedly. It's funny how I seem to spend a whole lot of time trying to teach Christians how to get saved. Is that an oxymoron or what? We've got to understand God's word and his plan, not man's plan and denominational beliefs and tenets line up with his word. He's begging you, brothers, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Crucify your flesh. Stop doing what you want. The gospel of the kingdom is doing what he wants. 
It ain't about you no more. If God is your God, let Him be God. Amen. Total surrender. Holy. To be holy. To be acceptable unto God. Is what you're doing acceptable? Think about those times. You're sitting there in the middle of, you know what it is. You know what you did. I know what I did. Was I sitting there thinking, boy, God, I know you're happy about this. <laughs> no. And he ends it saying, because this is your reasonable service. When you understand all that God has done for you, it's like, dude, get a clue, man. We, how we could think of, uh, about doing anything less than surrendering is mind-boggling. He said, that's your reasonable service. This, is, this would be the least you could do is say, okay, God, have your way. And look at verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. And sad to say, that's where so many people that claim to be the church are. And God's saying, no, it ain't. Everything that names the name isn't. You've got to understand that. You go further in the book, Christ tells you that on that day, people are going to say, but didn't I do this and didn't I do that? And Jesus says, I don't, I don't even know who you are. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's how I started out today. Say, let's get in the book and wash our minds. Let's renew. Let's get away from the world's thoughts, this world's the kingdoms of this world and start thinking about his kingdom, his game plan, his ways. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you get your mind renewed? You get in the book. You find out what the thus saith the Lord is and you say, okay. Amen. I was preaching another sermon and I was talking about how I love uh, when you're going through like Matthew 5. And it gets to the point where Jesus starts talking to the people and he says, you have heard, and he talks about what they all been hearing, and then the next verse under says, but I say, and then he goes down to another one, you have heard, and another verse down, but I say, he keeps telling about all this stuff they've heard, but then Jesus said, but I say. That's the gospel of the kingdom. What does God say? What did Jesus come here on planet Earth and walk out, live out, and speak out for you to follow? That's what you'll be held accountable for. That's what we have to walk in. That's the gospel of the kingdom. Amen. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What's good to God? What's perfect to God? God. So what's he want from you? To be like him. Boy, that's a tall order. Hey, he's the one that said it. And only he can do it. And it only happens when you lay your will down and say thy will. It only happens when you crucify that flesh. You make a choice, a decision of your own will. Because God will not steal your will. He'll tell you his desires. But if you want to look at God and say, no, I just want to go on to hell. I'm going to party with the rest of my friends. You better think about what you're saying. Well, I've never said that. What about your actions? You realize your life huh, speaks volumes? Look at 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3, 4, and 7. I'll go through here. It says, for this is the will of God. People say, I don't know what the will of God is. So what you're saying is you don't read the Bible, right? For this is the will of God. Even your sanctification. What? 
God wants to set you apart from the kingdoms of this world. He wants to set you apart from what Satan has been doing to you. He wants to set you apart for his will. Why? Because he loves you. And it says, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. For God hath not called us to uncleanness, but to holiness. You claim to be a Christian. God said, I'm calling you to holiness. If you're not walking in holiness, you're not an obedient child. You're not pleasing to the Father. You're not walking according to his kingdom. You're still in your own. Let me read that again for you in the Living Bible. I encourage y'all, get a different version. Get simple versions to help break it down for you. I want everybody from the youngest to the oldest to be able to hear the word of God and understand. God, by your Holy Spirit, speak to your people. In Jesus' name. Verse 3 and 4 here in the Living Bible says, For God wants you to be holy and pure and to keep clear of all sexual sin so that each of you will marry in holiness and honor. What? You mean we're not supposed to be out sleeping around, shacking up with everybody, having babies and marriage? What? Do you know what an awesome gift it is for a couple to get married and say, I'm a virgin. I have kept myself for you. Verse 5. Not in lustful passion as the heathen do. Folks, you out here running around doing this kind of stuff? God's calling you a heathen. He ain't calling you a sheep. He's calling you a goat. Better get a clue. In their ignorance of God and his ways. He's saying, you living like that. You ain't got a clue what I want. You're not listening to me. You're not following me. Verse 6. And this also is God's will. That you never cheat in this matter by taking another man's wife. Because the Lord will punish you terribly for this, as we have solemnly told you before. Verse 7, for God has not called us to be dirty-minded and full of lust, but to be holy and clean. If anyone refuses to live by these rules, he is not disobeying the rules of men, but of God. Who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Amen. God has laid his will out in his word. For you to say, well, I don't know what God's will is. You're telling me you can't be a Christian because Christians follow Christ. They get in the book like he says. When you're saying, I ain't in that book, I don't know that. Why not? The gospel of the kingdom is about doing God's things, God's way, here and now, in earth, as it is in heaven. That's why Christ came. He came to set you free, to put His Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, is in you to walk in fellowship with Him, not to be a defeated foe not to be don't settle for less than what God has for you God talked about this even in the Old Testament people talk about oh, all the way from the beginning God has never changed his mind matter of fact 
Turn back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31. I'm going to start Jeremiah 31, 31. Folks, I can go cover to cover. We can go to Old Testament, New Testament. I can go from index to maps. It don't matter. He doesn't change. In Jeremiah 31, starting in verse 31, it says, The day will come, says the Lord, when I will make a new contract or a new covenant with my people. See, back here is the Old Testament. This was back here, most of y'all remember, if you had any, if you ever watched the movie, The Ten Commandments. <laughs> this is back when God scribed with his finger the Ten Commandments. You know, we basically got writing in stone of God's heart, God's desire, God's plan for his people. And here he's telling them he's going to do a new contract, a new covenant. And look at verse 33. He says, this is the new contract I will make with them. I will inscribe my laws upon their hearts so that they shall want to honor me. He's saying we are swapping from these external kind of tablets over here. I'm bringing it inside. I'm making this personal. I want to come and dwell in you, have a one-on-one -on -one relationship. I want to put me in you, in your hearts. Then they shall truly be my people, and I will be their God. Think about this. All the way back here in the Old Testament, God's knowing Jesus is coming. Things are going to be changing. And he's all excited to tell them, man, things are going to be happening. Look forward to this. In verse 34, the last part of 34 there, I'm reading this out of the Living Bible just for clarity. It says, for everyone, both great and small, shall really know me then. Do you know that's God's desire for you? To really know him. You know how many people know about God versus know him? There's a difference here. Yeah, I'll go to church. But are you the church? Does God know your name? Are you known in heaven? For everyone, both great and small, shall really know me then, says the Lord, and I will forgive them and forget their sins. Christ is coming to do a work in us, to clean us up, to make us fit for his kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom is Christ died, paid a price to save you from your sin, to bring you in fellowship with him. Don't listen to this phony preaching, live like the devil. God's got it. It's okay. That's not his message. Mm. God basically, now he's touching the heart of Christians and he writes his laws or his desires within the heart of a person. You know on the inside. When you read through the New Testament, he said, you know, you, you've heard in the past that, you know, if you went out and committed adultery, you did a bad thing. He says, I'm telling you, if you just thought about it, He made this <laughs> tougher. He brought it down where you live. It's no longer an external. Christ says, what's going on here? What did you got going on? Did you kill that man? No, but I thought about it. Well, if you're thinking about it, you're still as guilty. He's making it tougher, not less. Christ is a higher standard, a higher calling. <laughs> Got to understand, this is what we're talking about, a heart of flesh. He's he putting him here in you so that you'll know in your heart of hearts. You know when you're getting ready to do something. God's talking to you. He doesn't say, yes, go for it. If you're his, he's going to let you know this really isn't what I want for you, brother, son, daughter. 
God's word is alive and he dwells within us. It's no longer just an external t stone tablet per se. Yeah, we got the written word, but it does you no good sitting there. It only works when it gets in here. You got to eat of him. Christ said, you got to eat my flesh, drink my blood. You got to take him in. We consume him and then are consumed by him and move through him for this world to be the light and the salt that they need to speak his truth. The church of Jesus Christ is holy, pure, and true. And it follows after a holy God. Well, that ain't the people I know. I know some guy. Well, he ain't the church. Understand, there is a big difference between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of brother so-so. There's a big difference between the church and that building on the corner. Got to get in, get the difference of the definitions and terminology here, folks. Understand the heart of God. <laughs> if you're truly the church, here's what happens to the church. If it stumbles, it's quickly rebuked and corrected. God lets his people know, eh, thy rod and thy staff. God loves you. He doesn't want harm to God. Understand God's word said that he would that none should perish. He'll quickly rebuke you and correct you. Confession will occur. Repentance and forgiveness takes place. And it is quickly brought back into right fellowship with God. That's a Christian. Christ died for the if you fall. He didn't die. Just go out and just keep falling. It's all right. That's not his desire. And anybody preaches different, good Lord said, it'd be better to tie a rock around your neck and pitch you and Get a clue here, folks. Get in his word. And basically, folks, all of this is accomplished through the blood of Jesus. It's all about him. You can do nothing on your own. A lot of times I start talking about God's word and you're starting to say, well, it works. No, I'm saying it's God that works. Get a clue. True Christians follow Jesus. They're converted and regenerated by the power of God. And they walk with God. There's a difference. You know it. A supernatural work has occurred in your life. Changes have been made. You become a new creature. You don't think like you used to think. You don't want to do the things you used to do. Oh, okay. Okay, let me rephrase that. The thoughts still come. Remember I said... Satan kept coming back to Jesus. He's going to still keep coming back to you too. But now if Christ is in you, when they come, you start thinking, that's not going to please Jesus. Before it was like, oh yeah, let's go. But if Christ is in you, it's, hmm. Is that really going to please my father? Conviction occurs. God will stir you in your spirit and let you know, that ain't for you. Shut the dough. Keep out the devil. Right? Remember we read earlier, don't give him no place. Unbelievable. You become a new creature. God writes his laws on your heart and the old ways pass away. If you're still doing what you've always been doing, <clears throat> are you really saved? As a Christian, the Holy Ghost will reveal God's holiness to you and convict you of sin. If you're truly God's, he doesn't leave you alone. If you can run out and live like the devil and it don't bother you, guess who you belong to? Mm. 
going against God's desires or walking outside of his will is an extremely uncomfortable place for a true Christian to be. You know, am I going to say that a Christian never falls? No. I'm going to say that's not their desire to practice. And because of Christ, because of the blood, Christ can forgive us. But nowhere does he say, that's where I want y'all to live. I want you to walk like the devil. How are they supposed to know you're a Christian if you look like them? If you talk just as filthy, you do the same garbage. They're looking for answers. And if you ain't showing them, A true Christian wants to ma maintain a good relationship with God. We're freed from the burden of the law when we're given the power to fulfill it from within. It's not a burden. It's obedience. I don't do what God says to earn salvation. I do what God says because I am saved and only now because I am saved and his spirit is in me only now can I be obedient Amen. I couldn't without him only in Christ even Jesus himself when they come up to him calling him good good whoa whoa why do you call me good ain't, not, ain't nobody's good but God guess what it still is true today ain't nothing good in you unless God's there and the only time I can be good is if I let God do something in me only what he does is good. My flesh, there ain't no good in me. But, but when I allow God to rule and reign, to be the king, and I walk in his kingdom, and I surrender and obey, God can use me as he wants, here and now, in earth, as it is in heaven, folks. That's the gospel of the kingdom. Look at 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16. So having said all that, I love the verse 13 starts off with, wherefore? It's kind of like, okay, therefore now, now that we've covered all that, <laughs> verse 13 says, gird up the loins of your mind. Grab a hold of that head, folks. <laughs> Be sober. Get a clue. Wake up. And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written... Be ye holy, for I am holy. God wants you to walk differently than this world. Is this you? Is this how you're walking? Obedient. Not like the world. Not running after the former things. Remember, old things are supposed to pass away. Be holy. That's God's word. You can also find that back in Leviticus 11.44. He started from the beginning. He's still saying in the end. He never changes. Look at Matthew 5, verse 48. Matthew 5, 48. Here Jesus is preaching to the multitudes. Now think about this. The other times we were talking, he was talking to the disciples. Now he's talking to the multitudes. He's talking to the world. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. He's telling everybody his desire for them. He's not talking to just Christians. He's inviting everyone into his kingdom to be like him. He's letting everyone know. He doesn't want anybody to be ignorant. That's why he's telling us to preach 
his gospel, his message. I don't want anybody to perish. And here he's telling them all what his desires are. Not just for those church people. No, it's for his people to be his church, his body, his bride. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.17. I've been quoting it, but I'll show you where I got it from. Right there, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Here's a good way to know if you truly are saved. Are you really a Christian? Are you just religious? It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Are you new? Are you different? Have you stopped doing the things you used to do and started doing things that God's asked you to do? Oh, you talking that work salvation again? No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm saying if you're saved, it'll show. Amen. God in you does different than the world in you. And the world will see the difference. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile, defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. That's a heavy word. God doesn't want you messing your body up, messing up anything about you. God designed you, planned for you from before the foundations of the world we read earlier. And he said, don't think you can just trash it and do whatever you want with it. That's not going to make me happy. If that's what you're believing, you're not believing God. If that's the way you're living, you're not living God. According to God, you're living in this kingdom, not his kingdom. Change kingdoms. Look at Hebrews 10, 26 and 27. Got a couple more real quick. I know we're running on time. Hang in there with me. You won't be sorry. Hebrews 10, 26 and 27. Now, these are hard words. That's why I want you to write them down and underline them. It says, for if we sin willfully... After that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Wow. Let me read that again in the ERV version. Break it down for you. If we continue sinning, all that is left for us is a fearful time of waiting for the judgment and the angry fire that will destroy those who live against God. You telling me you're walking and acting like the devil and you think you're saved? You tell me you're doing everything you want and nothing that God wants and you think you're going to heaven? You've got to understand he kicked Satan out and a third of the angels because they thought that too. Romans 6, 1 and 2. Romans 6, 1 and 2. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? that grace may abound? Verse 2, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Christ came to set you free from sin, not to let you walk in it and think it's okay. The gospel of the kingdom is about changing masters, changing kingdoms, changing everything about you to him. God has clearly called us to a life that puts sin away. That's what Christianity is all about. Christ-like. 
He who knew no sin wants you to be like him. And without him, you can't do anything. We are, by the Spirit of God, to say no to sin, just like Christ. When Jesus was confronted in the wilderness, he kept saying, get behind me. It is written. It is written. So what do you do? Get in the book and find out what is written so you know what to say when he comes. I didn't say if he comes. I said when he comes because he's coming. He's going to try to play racquetball with your brains. And only Christ can defeat him. You can't. To preach that it's okay to just keep on sinning because grace is going to cover it, that's contrary to the Word of God. The gospel of the kingdom is that we have been called to walk like Christ, here and now, in obedience to God our Father. The sacrifice of the Lamb of God makes this possible. Our prayer needs to be, Dear Lord, please draw me by your Holy Spirit to be one with you. <laughs> Help me to live in a manner where your will is done, not mine. That's the kingdom. Walking, pleasing to your Heavenly Father. Walking in obedience, in close fellowship. I want to hear that well done. Not who are you. I close with the model prayer. Everybody got that out of Matthew 6.10. It says, Thy kingdom come. That's God's kingdom. Thy will be done in earth. Right here. In me. In this piece of earth. This was dirt he picked up and breathed life into. Thy will be done in this earth. As it is in heaven. That's the gospel of the kingdom. Living according to God's standards, God's desires, understanding His heart and surrendering to Him. I challenge you today, search your hearts, search the scriptures, find out if you're in the faith. If you are great, encourage your brethren if you're not, surrender. Confess your sin before Almighty God and ask Him to forgive you. Repent. Change your ways. Turn from this world to Him. God loves you. This church loves you. Y'all have a blessed day. Thank you.